Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-argument episode of SCOTUScast, Incorporation and the Eighth Amendment's Excessive Fines Clause Edition. I'm your host, Bridget Flaherty. On November 28, 2018, the Supreme Court heard argument in Timms v. Indiana, a case involving the Eighth Amendment's Excessive Fines Clause, the Fourteenth Amendment, and the concept of incorporation against the states. In May 2013, Tyson Timms was apprehended en route to a controlled drug purchase, having previously purchased about $400 worth of heroin from undercover police officers. He ultimately pled guilty to felony counts of drug dealing and conspiracy to commit theft, and was sentenced to six years of imprisonment, with five suspended to probation. Timms also had to pay roughly $1,200 in police costs and related fees. The state of Indiana then sought forfeiture of Timms' Land Rover, which he had used $42,000 of his late father's life insurance proceeds to purchase but had driven to buy and transport heroin. Lower courts ordered the vehicle released to Tim's, concluding that forfeiture of the Land Rover would impose an excessive fine in violation of the U.S. Constitution's Eighth Amendment. The Supreme Court of Indiana, however, reinstated the forfeiture on the grounds that the U.S. Supreme Court had never incorporated the excessive fine clause against the states via the Fourteenth Amendment. The United States Supreme Court thereafter granted certiorari to address that issue, whether the Eighth Amendment's Excessive Fines Clause is incorporated against the states under the Fourteenth Amendment. And now, to discuss the case, we have Christopher Green, Associate Professor of Law and HLA Hart Scholar in Law and Philosophy at University of Mississippi School of Law. Timms v. Indiana is a case that the Supreme Court heard at the end of November about whether the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment applies to states as well as the federal government. Timms was a relatively small-time drug dealer who drove to a fake drug deal on both sides. He didn't have any drugs, and he was meeting an undercover officer, but he was driving to this fake drug deal in a relatively nice car, a slightly more than $40,000 Land Rover. He was convicted of drug dealing and sentenced to six years. Indiana also took his car, which, it said, had been used to commit the crime. The Indiana trial and intermediate courts, however, said that the seizure of the car was grossly disproportionate and so violated the Eighth Amendment as applied to the state by the Fourteenth Amendment. But the Indiana Supreme Court then said that the excessive fines clause didn't apply to states, and the U.S. Supreme Court then agreed to hear the case. So, you might remember, in 1787, the framers of the Constitution sought to protect liberty not through a Bill of Rights, but chiefly by separating power into three branches. State constitutions, which we had had since independence in 1776, generally had Bills of Rights, but not the initial federal Constitution. And when it was unveiled, people like Adams and Jefferson said, hey, where's the Bill of Rights? But, in response to anti-federalist complaints, People like James Madison agreed, okay, we'll have a Bill of Rights for the federal constitution too, but it only governed the federal government, not states. If you were upset that a state had, say, imposed an excessive fine, you could argue that issue to state courts under the state constitution, but not the federal constitution. So if you lost in the state courts, you couldn't go to D.C. and pitch the issue again to the U.S. Supreme Court. That was the pre-Civil War Bill of Rights. But then we had the Civil War, and following Southern mistreatment of the freedmen and unionists, we added the 14th Amendment, with two clauses that matter here. The Privileges or Immunities Clause, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and the Due Process Clause, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. When Jacob Howard explained the 14th Amendment to the Senate, He gave a bunch of the rights in the Bill of Rights as examples of privileges of citizens of the United States. Howard's handwritten notes indicate that he was very careful about his formulation. Only the personal rights protected in the Bill of Rights were privileges of citizens of the United States. In the Eighth Amendment, Howard listed excessive bail and cruel and unusual punishments, but not excessive fines. But a ban on excessive fines does seem like a personal right. 
To make a very long story, merely long, the court has had a series of cases where someone argued that the 14th Amendment protected something in the Bill of Rights against states. So we've had a bunch of incorporation yes cases and incorporation no cases. In 1884, in Hurtado, the court said no to the Fifth Amendment grand jury right. In 1916, in Minneapolis Railway v. Bombolas, the court said no to Seventh Amendment civil juries. In the 1890s, the court said yes to Fifth Amendment takings, and from the 1920s to the 1940s, the court said yes to all of the different parts of the First Amendment. In the 1960s, the court said yes to most of the rest of the Bill of Rights, reversing a few earlier no cases on the Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule, Fifth Amendment self-incrimination, Fifth Amendment double jeopardy, Sixth Amendment paid counsel, and Sixth Amendment criminal juries. In many of the 1960s cases, the second Justice Harlan proposed that maybe we should apply stuff in the Bill of Rights to the states, but in slightly modified form. Harlan never, however, won the day, though neither did the court embrace Justice Black's idea that the entire bill was incorporated. As a side note, I think Justice Harlan was right as a matter of the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, but people like Kurt Lash disagree and defend a variant of Justice Black's view. This issue will be discussed, by the way, at the opening panel of the Federalist Society Student Symposium at Arizona State in March 2019. Then, in 1972, in Apodaca, the court said no to incorporation of Sixth Amendment criminal jury unanimity in a split 4-1-4 decision with Justice Powell in the middle, taking a Harlan-style view that the incorporated right was different. After 38 years of radio silence on incorporation issues, in 2010, the court in McDonald incorporated the Second Amendment against states. But Justice Thomas said they should do something lots of academics like me have been urging for a long time. Switch from the Due Process Clause to the Privileges or Immunities Clause. The rest of the McDonald court, though, didn't want to do that, and stuck with the Slaughterhouse and Cruikshank precedents from 1873 and 1876, even though those are two relatively low-prestige opinions. The court of McDonald also rejected watered-down incorporation, saying more emphatically than they had before that Justice Harlan was wrong. The Robinson case in 1962 incorporated the Eighth Amendment Cruel and Unusual Punishments Clause, but the court didn't have any excessive fines in corporation cases. A few times they said the entire Eighth Amendment applied to states, but some other times they noticed that they hadn't ever had an excessive fines case. Until now, that is. As in McDonald, the pro-incorporation side in Tim's suggested using the Privileges or Immunities Clause, but unlike McDonald, they did so very briefly. In McDonald, by contrast, the Privileges or Immunities Clause got a lot of attention. I should add here that there's quite a bit of very specific evidence from the debates over the 1862 Second Confiscation Act that excessive punishments were not thought to violate the Fifth Amendment's Due Process Clause, so devotees of original meaning have particular reason to switch clauses here. And unlike McDonald, almost any of the chief views of the Privileges or Immunities Clause could produce a yes on incorporation, so it's an even easier lift than it was there. Also, there are a few other cases this term where the Privileges or Immunities Clause may get some attention. There's a 21st Amendment case on discrimination against new residents in alcohol distribution, a sort of Sains v. Roe with alcohol, and an Incorporated Establishment Clause case where seeing religious liberty through the lens of the privileges of citizens might help out the adoption of a coercion test. But in Tim's, there's one big issue. Do excessive fines violate the 14th Amendment? And five smaller ones. First, which clause is the vehicle for incorporation, due process or privileges or immunities? During the argument, the two newest justices, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, made super clear they were in favor of incorporation. Gorsuch referred to tradition going back to Magna Carta, but also suggested openness to using the privileges or immunities clause as the vehicle. Gorsuch misremembered the big decade of incorporation, thinking it was the 1940s instead of the 1960s, and used what the Onion once called still the leading argument for social reform stating the current year. Here we are in 2018, still litigating incorporation of the Bill of Rights. Really? Come on, General. Ginsburg worried that using the Privileges or Immunities Clause might imperil non-citizens' rights, and the fact that she seems worried about the prospect suggests there may be interest in the Privileges or Immunities Clause beyond Thomas. Kavanaugh asked, Isn't it just too late in the day to argue that any of the Bill of Rights is not incorporated? seeming to forget about Hurtado, Minneapolis Railway, and Apodaca. Or maybe instead states need to prepare for the incorporation of grand jury, unanimous criminal jury, and civil jury rights from the 5th, 6th, and 7th Amendments. The second subsidiary issue is, what is the standard for incorporation? Is it tradition, mere presence in the Bill of Rights, or something else? 
A tradition-based standard, which seemed to have been victorious in Glucksburg in 1997, then on the rocks in Lawrence in 2003, but then alive again in McDonald in 2010, then somewhat dead in a Burgerfell in 2015, seems like it might be alive again. The litigants, Justice Gorsuch and Chief Justice Roberts, pressed tradition, but Sotomayor pushed against it somewhat. Our third and fourth auxiliary issues. Does the same standard govern states and the feds? And is civil forfeiture a fine? In 1993, Austin said federal civil forfeiture was a fine subject to Eighth Amendment excessiveness challenges, but Indiana urged the court to overrule Austin or limit it to the feds. The court did not seem receptive to this suggestion, although reconciling Austin with Bennis v. Michigan, which said in 1996 that there's no innocent owner defense to civil forfeiture, is a little difficult. Justice Breyer, who dissented in Venice, pushed back on the idea that civil forfeiture was categorically non-excessive with the example of forfeiting a car driving five over the limit. The Indiana SG replied, In rem forfeitures have always been with us, and they have always been harsh. Alito and Chief Justice Roberts seemed most receptive to the argument from tradition here, but the open embrace of harshness did not seem to grab the others. Justice Sotomayor seemed especially unhappy. The fifth sub-issue is whether this particular Land Rover forfeiture was unconstitutionally excessive, grossly disproportionate, in the language of earlier cases. Alito, Breyer, Kagan, and Roberts suggested if six years in prison isn't grossly disproportionate, neither is a $40,000 forfeiture. If Indiana wins, this seems their best chance, but it's never good for respondents when their most promising ground isn't the ground relied on below. Kagan and Gorsuch suggested just saying yes on incorporation and sending the case back, and that seems like the most likely bet. If that happens, it could happen very soon. But if they do the right thing and reopen the slaughterhouse question, it could take a lot longer. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 